You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot talking with you this time about a sovereign God and a woman's pain. I've been telling you the story of an Irish missionary to India named Amy Carmichael, author of 40 books, founder of a remarkable work for children called Donovore Fellowship, which is still going strong. Amy Carmichael was born in 1867 in a tiny village in Northern Ireland, and we've taken her through the story until she's 63 years old. She had a habit of giving very picturesque names to the villages, or sometimes taking an Indian name and giving it a rather more picturesque translation than the word actually called for. And there was a town called Kalakadu, which literally meant scrubland. She named it Joyous City, with no idea of the irony that that name would someday hold. In 1926, she went with several others from Donavur to preach outside the temple, the Hindu temple, that is, in Kalakadu. They found a drama company setting up its stage, and she asked permission to tell the story of Jesus. To her amazement, they assented. And so she got up on the stage before the drama took place and told the old, old story. A week later, she was back again. There was no indication in Kalakadu that anybody wanted to hear the message that she had to give. And everything seemed to be closed to them. People knew Donavur. They knew the people who worked in Donavur. And in many of these strongly Hindu villages, there was absolutely no welcome whatsoever for them. In fact, no one would even rent them a house. But five years later, in 1931, there was a house for rent. She discovered that the reason it was for rent was because it was said to be haunted. A curse had fallen on it, and anyone who lived in that house would be cursed. She went ahead, rented it for a dispensary, and two of the Donovore women were assigned to live there and run a dispensary for the village people. On October 24th, 1931, all was ready for these two women to go and live there, but Amma, being the mother of the family, wanted to go and make sure that all was as she wanted it to be. That morning, Amy had been praying for guidance about money. And she prayed this, Do anything, Lord, that will fit me to serve Thee and to help my beloveds. When they got to Kalakadu that evening, the key to the house couldn't be found. So there was quite a long delay, and by the time they found the key, it was twilight. Amy made a trip to a palm leaf outhouse, a new outhouse, of course, in the backyard. And for some reason, the coolies who had dug the hole had dug it just inside the door instead of at the back. She didn't see the hole. She fell across it. It was what they call a bore hole, not wide at all, but she fell across it in such a way as to break her leg, dislocate her ankle, and twist her spine. The village people, of course, knew that this was indeed the curse of Allah. Dr. Pohl, Amy's personal physician at that time, a missionary from Ireland, was summoned. They both had confidence in the one who sets limits to the powers of darkness. Even though perhaps there is such a thing as a curse, and we know that there is no question about the existence of demons and of an enemy of our souls named Satan, his power is limited, and they knew that the one who sets those limits was greater than he. And so they prayed for healing. She had to be taken in a truck over a very, very rugged road, and there was great pain. Her injuries were not really serious enough to have confined her to the room for the rest of her life, but in fact, that's what happened. She was confined to her room for the next 20 years, when she died at the age of 83. There were complications and various reasons why this was the case. 
But when I visited India in 1984, I was given the privilege of not only seeing her room, which was called the Room of Peace, but of actually using her writing table. Can you imagine the thrill it was to me to visit Donavur, to walk around its paths, visit its bungalows in the house of prayer, see the farms, and actually sit in the Room of Peace, which had belonged to Amy Carmichael? I felt as if I had been there before because I'd read all of her 40 books, most of them more than once, and I had poured over the pictures in the books that show the buildings and the gardens and the beautiful paths. It is a place of peace, the whole compound of Donavur. I remember walking into that room and feeling as though Amy Carmichael was still there. I heard Billy Graham say that he felt such a holy presence when he went into that room that he could do nothing but drop to his knees. Amy's description of her own room was this. It was not built to be a personal room at all, but a general home room with a wide veranda so that many girls could sleep here with me. A teakwood partition divides the room in two, a great convenience in long illness, and as you come in through the blue curtains near the door, you see on the right hand teakwood paneling, and on the left, the bookcases to which the household come when they want biography, missionary and otherwise, and books of other kinds, too. For all through my life, friends have sent me books. They are my great luxury, my mental change of air. Facing as you come in are three big windows looking out on greenness where a pair of blue kingfishers continually fish for minnows in large vessels set under the trees. When I visited that room, there was a mounted tiger head on the left wall of the entrance corridor. Then there was a picture of a snow-capped mountain painted by her friend Dr. Somerville, who had climbed Everest. Then there was a pendulum clock and something that certainly was never there in her lifetime, one of the rare photos of Amy Carmichael. She refused to allow people to photograph her, so the photos are few and far between. There was a little room off to the left where the precious log books were kept that I was allowed to look at, and then the door opening onto the veranda with its almost zoo-sized birdcage, which she used to fill with brightly colored birds, and she would allow them to fly out of the birdcage and around her room, much to the disgruntlement of her nurses. There was bougainvillea in shades of pink and purple and salmon, and wonderfully scented white jasmine, growing on the pillars of the veranda. The teakwood partition makes a dressing room which leads to the private bath, still with its primitive fixtures, a huge vessel for water, and the little brass vessel that you use to pour water over your head. There was, of course, no running water. And over the mirror in her private bathroom were these words, Servant of All. There were texts all around the room, one very large one said, Good and acceptable and perfect. Words referring to the will of God from Romans 12, 2. Amy herself wrote in her little book, Rose from Briar, one of her 40 books, which is in print still today, Rose from Briar. She said, As I lay for two hours or more in the dark on the sand at Joyous City, this is referring, of course, to her accident. As I lay before help came, that which had to be endured seemed to give a sharpness to thought. I thought of men tormented not by accident, but on purpose in this same town and many another eastern town. I stood alongside the English judge who at that time openly fought torture in this district. I blessed God afresh for every man, whosoever he be, who fights that infernal thing, in this or any land, and as one may look through a very small window upon a very great view, I saw in a new way a fragment of what we mean when we say Calvary. The ministry of doctors and nurses appeared to me more than ever before as a divine thing then, and I felt that our Lord Jesus, beholding them, must love them, and greatly desire to work together with them, laying his hand upon theirs as they work, in guidance and benediction. So, though through these months, acceptance has been a word of liberty and victory and peace to me, it has never meant acquiescence in illness, as though ill health 
were from him who delights to deck his priests with health. But it did mean contentment with the unexplained. Neither Job nor Paul ever knew, so far as we know, why prayer for relief was answered as it was. But I think that they must stand in awe and joy as they meet others in the heavenly country who were strengthened and comforted by their patience and valor and the record of their father's thoughts of peace toward them. There is no way of knowing how many thousands of people have been strengthened and comforted by Amy Carmichael's patience and valor. And this little book from which I've just read, Rose from Briar, is meant for the ill. And as she says in her introduction, it differs from most of the books for the ill in that it is written by someone who is ill. Healing was almost taken for granted at first. They'd get their hopes up and then they would be dashed. Then cystitis would set in. Then they would pray. Cables came from England and Australia telling Amy that they were praying for her. And it seemed that healing was given. And then it seemed to be withdrawn. She wrote, The toad beneath the harrow knows exactly where each tooth point goes. The butterfly upon the road preaches contentment to that toad. I'm sure that there are some who are ill who have been listening to this program today. I hope that there have also been some nurses and doctors who have had the opportunity to hear the encouraging words that Amy Carmichael had for them. A sovereign God and a woman's pain.